Hello and welcome back to Guillotine to 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to introduce ionic compounds so that when we get around to naming them, it makes sense why they're named the way they are. Uh, so we're going to learn the basic structures of ionic compounds and then a little bit about crystal lattices and how that affects the properties of salts. So our old friends, uh, Question Bear and Answer Dog, are back. In the last episode, they became ions and got stuck together. So remember, cations have the positive charge, anions have the negative charge, plus a cat anion. Uh, remember that uh, ions are going to exchange electrons to get those full valence shells to become isoelectric and noble gases. And when they do, uh, the opposite charges will be attracted to each other, and that's where ionic compounds come from. So when the polar bear and the dog are attracted to each other, uh, they form what's called an ionic bond. Now these are often known as salts. Um, and remember that uh, the, the overall salt is going to have a neutral charge, even though it might have charges within it of both the cations and the anions. And that shouldn't be too hard of an idea to understand. I mean, think about atoms themselves. You've got the positive protons and the negative electrons in there, and yet the atom manages to have an overall negative, I mean, an overall neutral charge. So the idea of scaling that up to the next order of magnitude, where you have um, uh, positive cations and, and negative anions, again, canceling each other's charges out for a neutral compound shouldn't be that far of a stretch. Uh, and the important thing we're going to show you is that although you have a formula like sodium chloride, NaCl, that actually represents a ratio of ions and not the whole physical structure. So let's take a look and see what that means. So let's say that we have a chloride ion um, and a sodium cation there. Now you might think that's NaCl, but that's, that's far from NaCl because what's going to happen is um, each one of those ions are going to be continually surrounded by ions of the opposite charge. I mean, that chlorine is an attractive target for any sodium, and so you're going to start getting surrounded by ions of the opposite charge. And the number of ions that pack around other ions depends on charge and size. But what's going to happen is this is going to continue on, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in all directions until you get a giant sort of jungle gym of cations and anions. Now, obviously, we couldn't go around and name this entire thing, and it would be different for every crystal, so it'd be a semi-disaster. Um, and so what we do is we find the ratio of the ions, and then we write that as a formula. So even though this giant mess might be, you know, a, a large numbers of sodium ions and large number of chlorine, chlorine atoms, uh, we reduce it to the simplest whole number ratio. And so, that's, and so that formula then can represent any sized crystal. So if you have a big piece of table salt or a little tiny piece of table salt, uh, it doesn't matter. They can all be represented by the ratio NaCl. And so this 3D arrangement is what's called a crystal lattice, and you've certainly heard the term lattice before, whether you see the lattice on the side of a house or the lattice top of a pie, um, you know, but this is a 3D uh, lattice. So think again of a jungle gym of alternating ions that you'd want to play around in. Um, again, and due to the fact that these ions are surrounded by ions of the opposite charge, they're extremely stable. They have strong bond energies because, again, you're surrounded by everything you want to be around opposite charge. And so these are pretty hard to break apart. Now, each crystal can have different shapes, and those shapes are known as unit cells. And unit cell is pretty much the smallest repeating pattern of a, a, of a crystal lattice. Um, so let's take a look at a couple simple examples here. I've got a little animation here. Um, now, we're only going to look at one type of, of a structure called the cubic structures, and there are many types of unit cells, and I found a nice video I will link to at the bottom. But here we've got like a simple cubic. And so if you think of sort of an invisible cube, you've got alternating ions in each of the corners. And that would go on in all directions. So each one of those would be surrounded by six. Um, but you could have something like this where you have an ion in the body center of a cube. And then on each of the four corners, you've got other things. And then, of course, another example of a cubic would be you sort of do an open a sandwich here, five, four, five. Um, and then you get a face centered. So on each of the faces of the cube, you've got a different ion. Now these don't have to be ions, and they certainly don't have to be alternative ions either, or alternating ions. These could be uh, atoms too. So ions are not the only things that form lattices. And I think that's what these guys get to at the bottom. So metals can form lattices too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so four things you should know about salts. Uh, 
couple couple trivia's about salts that'll help it easier to go forward. Uh, they they are added compounds. They tend not to include things like the H plus, the OH minus, which is called a hydroxide, or the peroxide. And we'll learn about the names of those in in just a couple lessons when we get to naming ionic compounds. Uh, they tend to be very poor conductors. Uh, unless they're molten or dissolved. And in that case, the ions are free to move around. And if the ions are free to move around, then they essentially um, can uh, kind of push a charge through a solution. The ions don't actually grab the electrons and carry them across, but for all intents and purposes, a current flows through the solution. And that's more of an electrochemistry thing. Uh, but notice that when it's molten or dissolved, those ions are free to move around. Um, and, and when those ions are free to move around, then again, we can have an, an effective charge move through the solution. But if they're locked up in a crystal lattice, those ions can't move, and so they're non-conductors. So if you tried to uh, put electrical wires into uh, salt, then salt will not be able to conduct. But once that salt was molten or dissolved, then you'd be in trouble. So um, that, that's the reason why... Uh, most water conducts electricity because you have ions floating around in there. And if there are ions floating around, then it can conduct electricity. Um, due to the strong bonds, they tend not to melt or boil easily. Uh, because again, to overcome uh, that, that uh, crystal lattice, you've got to overcome the force of opposite charges and a surrounding opposite charges. So again, imagine you're surrounded by whatever you wanted to be surrounded by, and then someone comes in and tries to get you out of that position. You're going to fight hard to stay there because it's exactly where you want to be. But one of the interesting things about crystal lattices is, is even though the bonds are strong, um, they tend to be hard and brittle. And this is confusing to students at times. But if you think about it, it actually kind of makes sense. And so sort of the, the, the thing that gives them their strength is actually their Achilles heel. Because if you think about uh, a crystal lattice, and, and these guys can help us out here. Hold on, let's get these guys all set up here. So let's turn these guys into a crystal lattice. So each one of these guys are surrounded by a uh, clip art of the opposite charge. Um, so right now they're all pretty stable. If you pick out any one of those characters, you'll see at least in this two-dimensional uh, plane that they are surrounded by ions of the opposite charge. And if it went three-dimensional, then there would be uh, another one below, above and one below. But if we shifted them over a layer, so let's shift them over one spot. Now notice what happens here. Now we've got a bunch of ions next to similar charge. And that's going to lead to repulsive forces. And then what's going to happen is uh, they're going to make like a crystal and cleave. And boom, they're out of there. And so that's why you, you can take something like table salt. And even though you couldn't melt it on your stove, um, you, you could get it to uh, cleave apart relatively easily um, because, again, of, the, of that repulsion of charge. No cyberball. And that's, yeah, that's not nice either. So anyway, so that's a nice introduction to ionic compounds there. Uh, now, again, the reason we're telling you about that is because if you understand the concept of crystal lattices, then when we get to naming ionic compounds, the names make a lot of sense. And when we get to covalent compounds, since they are formed in a different way, they have a different naming system. So if you understand the concept behind the different compounds, then the naming systems make a lot of sense. Okay, well, that's it for today. I um, uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, the lesson. Uh, and uh, have a great day.